How did you feel when you heard the news? My wife, I mean, I'm actually, as you mentioned, in Prague, and my wife woke me up at midnight with the news, and I felt very sad, although I must say amazed that she got as far as she did. When, when she left Australia in 2000, I wrote the book on her in 2001, and the book sold well, and she made a lot of money, I might say, and she, on the screen, said, well, she did. That was, you know, that was what, the, where the whole book came from. I was approached by a friend of hers who said, Nancy's going to die very soon, and, mate, I'm a rugby man, you're a rugby man, we're going to have to write a book to raise, to get us some money. She, she wants to go back and die in France. And I said, mate, I'm not a charity, I don't do books like that, um, but I would like to meet her. And I went up and I met her and I was knocked out by what a story she had to tell and called, actually, it was in Port Macquarie, and I called Harper Collins from the airport and said, I'm going to do this book and I'll get you the manuscript of the year. And when I, when anyway, I went to put her on the plane in 2003 and I looked at her and I thought, I'll never see you again. And mm. I've been to see her in London every year since and every single time I look at her and I always take a good look and I say to myself, well, Nancy, I'll never see you again. Now, I'm, in, I'm heading to London in about three hours um, and last time I saw her, which would have been... November last year, I, I did. I looked at it and thought, I'll never see you again. And that was the first time I was right in 10 years because yeah. she she had this, for, she was a, you know, and uh, the, the French expression, and force de nature. Yeah. You know, she was this force of nature, but she had this strength inside her. And uh, she was lucid up until, I would say, two, um, 18 months ago. Mm. 18, up until 18 months ago, she'd recognised me as soon as I'd come and see her. And last 18 months ago, for the last two times, it would take her five or ten minutes to, to you know, just recognise who I was. So on top of such an amazing story, <laughs> she was just seeing some shots of her there while uh, shaking her face in front of a young cadet or something like that. She was a great character too? She was a great character. She, was, she had an extremely prickly nature, OK? Right. Now, I, she, well, there's no, there's no, I'm not speaking ill of the dead. She, she was... A, she she had a volcano inside her, and one of the sad things is that she was, and she was absolutely upfront about this. She said to me, "The saddest day of my life was the day the war ended." She was a woman that was born for warfare, and she was born. She was a born leader too. I mean, she was strong personality, and she she and I had a, a quite a few. Well, we had a couple of strong blues early on in the course of writing the biography. Blues over what sort of stuff? Up. Uh, uh, she swore at me in a public restaurant. I mean, it was a long story. A, well, well, the story was, I, I said to her, I'd researched the story, and I said to her, well, I'll try to, I'm going to clean this story up. But it's exactly what happened. I mean, she, we were in the um, Bistro Moncur in Sydney, in Wallara, and I said to you, why did you raid a particular Gestapo headquarters? And she said, and she, she burst out. She said, what kind of a stupid fucking question is that? <laughs> And I was, I, 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 I said, I turned off the, I turned off the thing. And I said, Nancy, I honour you and I respect you, and I, I don't ask you to, to honour me, but you've got to have sufficient respect, you know, that you can't talk to me like that, okay? Be absolutely clear on that. Because I just can't, I can't work under those conditions. I said, Are we clear? And she said, Argh. As in, okay, yes. So I said, to make the point, I said, I said, to make the point, I turned the tape recorder back on. I said, Right, why did you uh, write that particular? <laughs> particular Gestapo headquarters and she looked me right in the eye and she roared right at me and into the microphone of my tape recorder. Ah, yo, God damn. And I, so, I, did... just, I, couldn't, I couldn't think straight and so the following day, I must say, when she'd sobered up, which she had, she sort of half apologised and we went on with it because she, it was such a strong story. Yeah. And did you she, did uh, you kind of come to the conclusion that you needed a person with a bit of that in their character to uh, do what she did back in the Second World War? Certainly. And she had that absolutely. She had that in her character. And I can tell you my favourite story when I was when I went to it. I got I think it was in the London Daily Telegraph in 1944 45. Maybe shortly after the war was over, or just before it was over a correspondent got to with the, the, these resistance fighters and they interviewed them. What's, and her nom de guerre was Madame André. And the line was this guy, this 19-year-old boy, said, who was in the resistance with her, said, Madame André is braver than Jacques and Jacques 
is the bravest of us all. Wow. I just thought that was a, lo- a lovely line. Mm. Um, and then another one, I mean, this is another thing. This is an indication of the kind of woman she was. The launch of the book was July 2001. Lieutenant General Peter Cosgrove, he and I laugh about this, but this is what happened. It was at the Jewish Museum in Surrey Hills, 300 people there. Lieutenant General Cosgrove on stage with me, with Nancy. Lieutenant General Cosgrove gives this to commander of the Australian Defence Forces, and he basically says, I'm paraphrasing, we've had many great warriors in Australian history. I don't think pound for pound we've ever had a warrior the equal of Nancy Wake. I'm proud to be here. I'm proud to launch this book. Ladies and gentlemen, I give you Nancy Wake. And 300 people, legacy, Red Cross, ambassadorial people, media, stand up, spontaneous standing ovation. And there is Nancy, finally stands up. And for reasons best known to herself, blares at the 300 people giving them a standing ovation. And these are her words, okay? Her whole speech, she said, I've just got one thing to say. I killed a lot of Germans and I'm only sorry I didn't kill more. Thank you. <laughs> and, sat down. and it was, it was just right, you know, because I, I, uh, it was just that volcano inside her was still there and it has not, it had not diminished. Wow. You know, whatever that was, that was nigh on 60 years later. It had not diminished. So, so how did an Australian end up in France back then? Well, she was. She went to. Uh, she ran away from home when she was eighteen. She landed in London in nineteen thirty, and she studied journalism. And she was then posted to Paris in thirty one to really what happened document the rise of Nazism across Europe. And she then uh, married a man, Henri Piocca, and she was living in Marseille uh, when the war broke out. And again, one of my favourite lines from it, and I always thought if I make a movie, which in fact they're meant to be. Bruce Beresford, by the way, has got the rights to the movie, you know, driving Miss Daisy, the whole thing. Yep. They, um, and he, he, he says to me he's making the film for next year. And I think they've actually got footage before she died. But she, when she kissed Henri goodbye, the word came that the was coming for you. So she was working with the resistance. And this is the first incarnation when she was living in Marseille. She worked for the resistance and then it got too hot for her. And she had to escape into Spain. Then she goes back to Britain. They train her up for the special operations executive like special agent and they parachute her then into, wow. into France. But when she kissed Henri goodbye, she said to Henri, Henri, je m'en vais, I am going. When we meet uh, when we meet again, um, you know, what was the line? Do not. I, it was basically, I know you. That's right. I know you will not be faithful to me. But when we meet again, do not ask me if I have been faithful <laughs> to you. She's <laughs> kiss on both cheeks and off she goes. And so, yet, and yet, I mean, again, this is a delicate point. But I ask the obvious. You know, you're one woman among seven thousand. You know, men, many of them are very good looking. French men, and she, uh, I sort of said, so, you know, given that's what she said to Henri, did anything happen? And she said no. Wow. Her exact words said no. If I had, if I had accommodated one, I would have had to accommodate them all. And that was a you know, delicate, but that's, that is what she said. Wow. Okay, so, well, how did she end up being most wanted by the Gestapo? Because she was, she was fantastic. I mean, she was, she was down there in the southern part of France in the first part of it. And there was this, you know, nascent resistance movement. And she was the best in the business at going through enemy lines, passing messages, sorting, d- doing, doing all kinds of courier jobs for the, for the, for the resistance movement, all kinds of, all kinds of stuff. And the line was that they called her Le Souris Blanc, the white mouse, mm. because every time they had her cornered, it seemed, you know, like we got her in the corner and then she was gone again. And part of it was she was a, Gorgeous looking woman, absolutely gorgeous looking woman. And again, with my amateur theorising, it seemed to me that the Germans were, you know, if they were looking for somebody, they were looking for somebody that looked like them, aggressive, you know, man with guns, whereas she was not like that. Mm. When, when you say she was going through enemy lines, was she going through surreptitiously or, 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 yes, talk, absolutely, or talking absolutely. her way through? Um, talking her way through, and, and uh, she, was, she was, you know, there was all kinds of stuff in those early days where they were the basically the resistance were contacting each other and there was a carrying of weapons, um, carrying of, of money, um, all kinds of 
that, that kind of things in the early days. In fact, I wish I had my I wish I had my book before me. Mm. <laughs> I don't. I'm pulling this out of my memory. Where's your but, Where's your memory? Um, you should, your memory should be good enough. You're only forty odd, aren't you? <laughs> fifty. I've just turned fifty. As a matter of fact, <laughs> I'm doing all right. <laughs> but did, did she ever get close to being caught? Oh yes, many times, and that was that was her thing. That was and that was why. And the other thing was, she. It's all coming back to me now. Her her one of her things was to she was good to the Jewish people. Okay, so there was when it was all breaking out. I was quite amazed actually with France. I I always thought that it was Germany that had been vicious to, to obviously to the Jewish people with the Holocaust. But I was amazed there was a certain level of complicity uh, from France in the early days, uh, certainly in Vichy France. Uh, didn't surprise me, but there was a lot of Jewish refugees, and in the early part of the resistance, that was the other thing. Nancy was good at taking refugees to the base of the Pyrenees. She would escort them to the base of the Pyrenees, hand them on to somebody who'd hand them on to somebody else, wow. and get them across the Pyrenees. And then when the when the Nazis came for her, she went on that same course. Now again, from memory. She had six goes at getting across before she finally did get across, but she got into Spain and then got back to Britain where she was trained with the Special Operation Executive. And the idea behind the Special Operation Executive was Churchill's to say, we've got all these resistance movements in occupied Europe. We need to coordinate them. We need to drop people in there, our people that speak their language, with radio operators so that they can communicate with us what do they need. And so that's where Nancy why she was dropped, where she was dropped in north of Clermont-Ferrand to make contact with the resistance leaders. She had a radio man with her. And so it was Nancy that had the power to make the skies rain with guns and money wow. to, 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 to do it all. So just finally, Peter Fitzsimons, has she received the recognition that she deserves? This has been a contentious point. When I went to see her for the first time in, in Port Macquarie in, I think, 2000 or 2001, and I did a story for the Sydney Morning Herald, that was the line from her. She said, you can tell the government to stick their medals where the monkey stuck his nuts. Now, I've got no idea where the monkey stuck his nuts, <laughs> but I had a fair idea what she meant. And she looked at what the protocol at the time was that the protocol was that each you are recognised by four by the entity for whom you fought. Now, she was fighting for Great Britain with a special operation executive in France. So she was recognised by Great Britain with the George Cross. She was recognised by the Americans for the fact that she'd saved two American pilots. With the So she got, the I think, the American Congressional Medal of Honour. And she was recognised in France for the Médaille de la Résistance. And uh, there was another one, too, from France. And, and over the years, there have been other forms of recognition. Mm. Well, no, no, no doubt she'll get a bit more recognition when, when this movie comes out that you talk about. It's been coming for 10 years, but we'll see. <laughs> right. OK, uh, Peter Fitzsimons, thanks uh, so much for talking to us and uh, may, maybe uh, Nancy Wake is up there giving Henri a kiss right now. Yes. <laughs> OK. Thank you. Bye-bye.